Hello, I'm Elaine Petricelli, and I am from Book Passage, the independent bookstore that has been bringing authors and readers together since 1976. And we are so happy you're with us today. We have two stores, one in Corte Madera, California, uh, and one in the Ferry Building in San Francisco, as well as a very active website, bookpassage.com, and our newsletter that tells everybody what's happening. So we're so happy that you're with us and we know that uh, you're going to have a great time this afternoon. I have been a friend, uh, not a friend, but a fan of Paula McLean. I've come to think of her as a friend because I have read all of her books and I have just loved every one of them. Uh, from A Ticket to Ride to Life, uh, like a family growing up in other people's homes. Uh, growing up in other people's houses is just a concept that haunts me, but the book was absolutely fantastic. And today, uh, with all that's going on in the world, it keeps coming back to me. Uh, Paris, A Paris Wife. The Paris Wife was about Hemingway's wife, Hadley, and her view of what was going on. While Circling the Sun was about Martha Gellhorn, and again, uh, I'm sorry, it was about Meryl, Bar Meryl Markham, I guess, uh, and, uh, and her flying and her life. And then Love and Ruin was about uh, Martha Gellhorn and Hemingway. But when the stars go dark is absolutely not to be missed. If you have read all of her books, you know the quality of Paula's writing. You know how engrossing it is. And it, this is getting the well-deserved great reviews because it is riveting. Uh, Paula has written for many publications, including the New York Times, O, oh, Cosmopolitan, but it is her books that I treasure. And uh, I will tell you that you will have times when you will not want to do anything else. So beware, there are scary parts, but oh my goodness, the people. So we are so happy that we get to celebrate when the stars go dark tonight and to celebrate with our friend, Jessica Noel, who is uh, the author of The Luckiest Girl Alive, uh, which by the way, if you have not read it, now's the time to read it because I always recommend reading the book before you see the movie, but it's in production and uh, I cannot wait to see this in uh, acted because as I was reading it, I thought, oh, even when she was in the gym, I could see it in a film. And her latest book is absolutely marvelous as well, Favorite Sister, in which five super successful women agree to go on a reality show. And you know about reality shows, you think, not until you read Favorite Sister. It is scary, it is riveting. And so I am going to turn this over to these two amazing writers, Paula McLean and Jessica Noel. Jessica. Thank you, Elaine. Yes, thank you so much, Elaine. <laughs> I think of you as a friend too, by the way. <laughs> I know, that was sweet. <laughs> that was really sweet. Thank you. Thanks for supporting us and for hosting us. And Jessica, I just have to thank you. We've never met, but I'm a huge fan of your work. And I think that your whatever niche you're carving out is all your own with uh, voice and character development and searing, smart, dialogue and I I just think I laugh out loud I was listening to favorite sister on <laughs> on audible and just gut gut punch bitchy but like perfectly relatably bitchy dialogue <laughs> and introspection Brett is one of my favorite characters of all time and anyway thank you for agreeing to do this and and I it's just it's such a pleasure Absolutely. The pleasure is all mine. Um, 
everything Elaine said, I echo um, the well-deserved reviews for this book. I'm just honored to be in conversation with you tonight. I am also so excited that you have come on over to the dark side <laughs> <laughs> with your first uh, venture into mystery writing, thriller writing, um, because we could always use more people like you, right? Really thoughtful writers who bring this very elevated prose to the genre. Um, you know, I've seen the book compared to uh, Michelle McNamara's uh, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, which is one of my favorites. I also just felt like there were so many shades of Tana French, who is one of my favorite writers. Absolutely. Just, Isn't she astonishing? She's astonishing. And like the quality of the writing, the very poetic nature of the writing, and also the very atmospheric setting, like all of those were present in When the Stars Go Dark. And so much more, which we will get into conversation about. I just want to talk to everyone who is joining us this evening. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to just write them up and they'll be dropped in the chat and um, I can pose them to Paula uh, toward the end of the hour if we haven't covered them already. Um, because like greedily, I have lots of questions of my own that I <laughs> need to have answered, but we'll try to get to audience questions as well. Um, so let's just start by setting the stage for the book. Give us the plot or tell us about Detective Anna Hart. Um, and just, yeah, you know, just for anyone who hasn't the, had a chance. Down dirty, to, the down and dirty readers. The down and dirty. Yeah. <laughs> the elevator pitch. <laughs> the elevator pitch. So Anna Hart is a seasoned missing persons detective based in San Francisco. Um, I'm a California native. This book was my opportunity because I live in Cleveland now to write a love letter to California and to be in California in my imagination, which was an absolute gift. Anyway, Anna Hart is a missing persons expert who um, undergoes a terrible, an unspeakable actually tragedy in her personal life. And her, I mean, she's just she, in shreds, she returns home. Now, home is a complicated idea for Anna, just like it is for me. Like me, she grew up in foster care, but the place she thinks of as home is Mendocino. And so she goes there to heal and to try to recover herself. And yet the moment she arrives, literally the moment she arrives, she sees a missing poster. A local 15-year-old girl has vanished and she becomes enmeshed, obsessed, like against good sense, against her own health, she becomes obsessed with this case and begins to think that actually she needs to solve this in order to solve the puzzle of her life. And that's kind of the book. And I also weave in real missing persons cases from the same time period. The book is set in the 1990s, pre-internet, pre-DNA, um, testing, criminal profiling, all of that. And so that's part of the story as well. So let me just ask you what, and part of what I love that in the advanced reader's copy that I received a few weeks ago is that there was a letter to the reader, um, which I always appreciate. And it spoke to um, how much of you drew from your own personal history for elements of this story. And there was this amazing quote from, a, I believe he's a professor, Joseph Campbell. Oh, Joseph Campbell, yeah, philosopher. Oh, it was such a stunner. It was, you know, it, in life, you're going to encounter um, great, a great chasm. chasm. A great chasm. A great yeah. chasm. And you just have to jump. And you, you use that to kind of describe your jump into genre writing. Um, so what, you know, what made you want to write a mystery? Yeah, it never occurred to me. You know, I don't make rational decisions. My subconscious, I think, has a big agenda. And um, I was deep in the middle of Love and Ruin, which is in the voice of Martha Gellhorn, you know, one of the 20th century's greatest war correspondents. She also happened to be the third wife of Ernest Hemingway. Anyway, there I was like in my imagination, I'm in Madrid in 1937, like surrounded by Franco's army. Like that's where I was in my work. And yet I went for a long dog walk with my golden doodle Piper. And um, midway through the walk, this character just kind of appeared. I, 
that probably happens to you too, right? We're just visited sometimes. Creativity is amazing. It doesn't, it has its own, whatever, it has its own rules and doesn't care what you're doing. Anyway, so I just saw this character and I saw where the novel, if I was ever gonna write it, was going to be set. You know, Mendocino is a place, if you've never been there, that has such physical presence. It's, it's not Malibu, right? It's crashing Pacific that kind of wants to eat your face. And mm -hmm. Mendocino is this beautiful Victorian village that seems like it's out of time. And the redwood forests and the eerie fog and all of it. And I just saw it. I just saw it. I saw Anna and I saw Cameron Curtis and I saw the ways that their fates would intertwine. And by the time I got home, I swear to God, Jessica, it was like I had been to the movies and I had this story and yet, you know, what was I going to do? I'm not, I don't know how to do this. And, and that's why I said in the, in the letter that's in the galley, in, in my terror and indecision about whether or not I could tackle this kind of story, I thought, okay, so maybe the other side, the dark side, as you say, <laughs> maybe the other side isn't as far. And it's really not. And I'm just curious um, where you started. It's not far, but it feels so far before you right. make that jump. So how did you start? Did you start with research? I heard that you contacted a retired detective. Yeah. Um, obviously you spoke about some of the missing girls, Polly Klaus. I didn't know that story actually. Obviously I knew JC Duggard. Um, so where did the research, did you start writing and then kind of fill in with the research? How did it all kind of shake out? So you're terrific at voice. I feel like voice is a huge engine in your work and to me, voice is everything. It's like the magic carpet that leads me into the story. And so Anna was so clear to me. I just started with her. I just started by letting her talk. Mm -hmm. She had a lot of backstory. She had a lot to say about her backstory, which I had to write through and then put over here mm -hmm. so I could write the front story. Because of course, in in the genre of fiction, you know, there has to be a page turning element, like the mm -hmm. plot has to work and it has to move forward. There, it's an engine. It's not, it's not like historical at all, where there's much more tolerance for backstory and for character development, et cetera. Like in this genre, it's like, if you don't have a dead body right away, like you're in right. trouble, <laughs> you're gonna put that book down. Um, so I started with Anna and I knew Cameron, but I didn't know her story. And I just let my subconscious sort of drive me kind of deeper and deeper into their relationship. The, the part where fact and fiction began to blur, which has been part of my writing life now for 10 years, right? Taking these women from history and animating their stories and enlivening their lives, their voices, inhabiting their lives. Um, so it felt like a natural jump, but I didn't plan to do that in this book at all until I started doing research. Like I said, I set the book in 1993 because I wanted to avoid a procedural. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do character-driven, atmosphere-driven, you know, story. And so it was just a it was just a practical decision. But once I did that and started to do some research, trying to get veracity into Anna's voice authority she's an you know she's an expert she has to sound like that and there has to be a wisdom and it's in her physical presence as well so I started doing research and I was listening to a podcast where the lead detective on the Polly Kloss case was talking about uh the sort of the uh the series of events the sequence of events and he said you know October 1st 1993 is when Polly Kloss was abducted from her bedroom during a slumber party um, while her 12 year old, you know, 12 year old friends watched. It was the most um, publicized missing persons case, certainly in California history, the largest manhunt in California history. And that happened 10 days after my missing, my imaginary wow. girl went missing, right? And you come to a moment like that, like all the hairs on the back of my neck mm -hmm. stood up. I just thought, I think this has to be part of my story. I don't know how to do it exactly. I don't know how it will fit in, 
but I believe it's meant to be that I need to tackle this as well and to, and to honor the lives and the deaths of, of real missing girls. It's not just a story. It's not just a novel. These, these horrible events happen. They need to be reckoned with. It's amazing. It is amazing when that happens, right? I've had, I've had a moment like that with the book I'm working on now, uh, just discovering the death of a historical figure the day after the death of another historical figure, both of who feature heavily in the book. And it, you know, it blows your hair back, you know, like you're like, it wow. Does. It feels eerie and it almost feels like pre- preordained. I don't know how witchy you are personally, but. Um... Well, I'm getting witchier. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, and this kind of leads me into my next question. I'm, I'm, you know, when things like that happen, um, I do feel this sense of, you know, I, there, maybe there's not a need to, uh, be as cynical as I am about mysticism. Right. And you feature a psychic in your book and in the fabulous New York times book review you got this week. I did love what the reviewer said about how, um, the psychic that is a character in your book um, offers like really valid kind of guidance, um, where like you have that moment as someone like me, who's like a borderline skeptic, you're (laughs) like, there is something here, you know? And then you, you see things come together in the story you're writing and you, you do wonder there, how much intuition and like what it is that you're, you know, women in particular have a sense about, um, so yeah, how did, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what, one of the things, um, it was like my favorite New York times review ever. And it, it landed <laughs> on my, on my blog date. It'll be in the book review later, but, um, and the reviewer described the psychic as like a secret ingredient that you can kind of taste, but can't quite identify. Yeah. And, um, I didn't know that there was going to be a psychic in the book. She just sort of appeared one day. And there definitely is a, a continuum because I too am have skepticism. And yet, and so does Anna, my main character. And yet Tally becomes more that the, the medium character becomes, to me, she's more of a therapist, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. She's the voice that tells Anna to trust her instincts, her intuition, her gut feeling her sense of the world and to trust her empathy, her compassion. So I'm really telling a woman's story, Mm -hmm. right? Woman to woman, like pay attention to how you feel and follow those instincts. And who doesn't need to be told that advice? Yeah. And I mean, it just kind of doubling down on, you know, these cosmic connections at right when I picked up your book, it was the book I had finished just before was Lewis Duncan's memoir called Who Killed My Daughter, which she published in 1989. Um, I was reading it for research for my third book. Um, Her daughter was was killed and it's an unsolved case. And I had no idea that, and Lois Duncan, of course, wrote famously, I Know What You Did Last Summer. Um, And first of all, just an amazing woman with an amazing life. Um, And so much, she basically, the case goes cold and she's like, I'm going to solve this and ends up um, in contact with several psychics. And that, that was the first shift for me about one, how a psychic could kind of function in a mystery in a reliable way. And in a way where you didn't roll your eyes and in a way where exactly what you said it feels like a woman's story and a woman telling you to listen to your intuition. And then I finished that book and I pick up your book and it's like, wow. <laughs> I'm knocking at your door, sister. Yeah. 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 So, She's not like a woo-woo character. And no, she doesn't not at all. Anything. She doesn't tell Anna what to do or where to go or where the clues are or anything like that. She just is this signpost. She's a sign, a sign post. And then to go back to what you said that I absolutely loved about giving Anna wisdom and authority. Mm-hmm. Um, this is what, this is what I remember and took from the book more than anything. And what I said is that reading this book as a fellow survivor of trauma, I felt 
safe in this book. I felt like I was in the hands of a protagonist who knew what she was doing, who cared about victims and who understood victims in a way that went above and beyond. Um, and I had this thought while I was reading it where I was like, this is, it is a whodunit because you don't know who took Cameron Curtis and you also don't know what happened to um, in Jenny. Past, right? mm -hmm. another, oh, oh, another victim, yes. Another yes. victim. Um, and, but it's also what it becomes in some ways is like almost a how done it. Like we've heard like a why done it, but like it's a how done it, like how victims and predators fit together. Um, and that to me was absolutely fascinating and just gripping and something that I had not, I've really not seen anyone pay that much attention to. Um, and that, that was also an added flavor of secret ingredient uh, to the book that I loved. So how, I mean, so did this retired detective that you interviewed, like, did he, was he the person that kind of gave you all this information about how they're looking at missing kids and their backgrounds or was it like an amalgamation, like amalgam of everything that uh, you've gone okay. through or? Yeah. So first of all, I just have to thank you for saying that, you know, I follow you on Instagram and you posted after you'd read the book that it made you feel safe. And I have to say that was just like the most flattering thing. And because I know some of your history, because you've written about it with such candor and courage, and I would even say ferocity, right, that I really admire. Um, I went there on my own. You know, the story, my story, the way that um, I've spent years of my adult life trying to unknot the residue of trauma and um, sexual violence and all of the pieces of the puzzles that were unclear to me as a kid when I was victimized, wondering how, how it had happened and what was drawing this person, these people toward me. Because when there's repetitive trauma, there's repeated violence, you begin to think there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's more that trauma leaves kind of a, a residue. And I, and I bring that up in the book. I talk about, and, and in fact, it's verbatim, Jessica, from a conversation that I had with a trauma therapist once who I was speaking with him about my story. And he said, so it's like this. And I put it in the book, just, I put it in the book verbatim. It's like this, everybody comes into the world with this bright light, that's the soul, right? Un, unmarred pure as snow. And then for one in seven or one in 10 or one in five, the numbers vary, trauma happens, complicity, shame comes in, silence, and it's like tar over that bright light. And when the soul shines through, it creates a bad signal. Mm -hmm. It creates a bad signal and that's how predators recognize victims. And it, I make it very clear in the book, it's not the victim's fault. <laughs> It's this thing that happens unconsciously. And of course, you know, who wants tar over their soul? Who chooses that? And yet it's there. Um, so that's, that's just, it's just baked into the book because it's baked into my life. And I just decided as I was writing the book that it was time to kind of connect the dots more overtly between my writing life and my personal life. The detective was huge for me. She, by the way. Oh, I good. Oh, God. I know. My it's much better. Bias showing itself. <laughs> it's okay. Um, it's even better. She's retired now, but fascinatingly, and she came into my life in a super fluky way that then later just felt like destiny. Um, and she is phenomenal, but she is Anna. She basically came up at the same time. She was a sensitive crimes detective during the early 1990s. And so she um, read several drafts of the book and we had countless conversations and she helped me step into the shoes hmm. um, in moments that I could not have imagined, like what happens when you open a trunk and there's a, 
you know, a decaying body. And what, what does that feel like? What does it mean to stand there and bear witness to that? And mm. um, it was, a, it was really an astonishing uh, collaboration and I'm marrying her, meaning I, she's, if I ever write another book, when I write another book, I, I already know that she's on my team. She's on my side and she loves, she's obsessed with Anna. She thinks she's a real person, which, you know, that's a bonus too. Yeah. Well, she yeah. feels like a real person. And I do just to quickly go back to what you were saying is like the, the thing that I appreciated so much about the way you did connect the dots um, in terms of how a victim and a predator fit together. It's like, that's such a fine line to tread, right? Because you don't want it to, the message isn't that it's the victim's fault, you know, but like, let's like dig deep and exactly and let's look at it because it's a thing it's a true it's a true statistic if you are statistic. if you are traumatized yeah. you are instantaneously your chances of it happening again you know i don't know the exact figure but, but they increase they increase exponentially and mm -hmm. if you're a victim of violence the likelihood that it will happen again yes is like four times more or five times more. And to understand that as someone who wants to not be a victim, I believe that we can all heal our own trauma no matter what it is that happens. And part of it though, is shining a light on it so it can't run and hide, right? The silence, the complicity creates shame and the shame creates more silence. And so in this book, I just really thought that it was imperative to keep shining that light and to kind of unpack these threads because, you know, that's how you take your power back. Mm -hmm. that's how you do it. Right. You do it and you become smart and very intuitive and all these great, you know, qualities that we saw in so many of your characters. Mm -hmm. I mean, what was it like to to live in this world, to live in this story at the time you were writing it, given your personal history, um, what did it feel healing? Was it heavy? You know, and yeah, I'm both, sure. right? I mean, yeah. and you've written and you've, you know, been very outspoken about how parts of your own experience have woven themselves into fictional moments in your story. So I want to be really clear Anna Hart is not me right? She has a completely different set of experiences and she has a different journey. She has a different story. What I gave her was some sort of like emotional infrastructure, more like an emotional DNA. I gave her some of my weight in order to feel closer to her as a character and to begin to trust her to lead me into this territory. And it worked beautifully. I just felt, I felt like what you said, honestly, Jessica, I felt safe with her. Mm -hmm. I felt like she was going to show me the way because she, you know, she had this knowledge and she had this empathy, you know, that's what we're always reaching for as writers, right? Greater and greater empathy so that we're never judging our characters, no matter what they've seen or heard or done or lived. And that was my goal for this. The tricky part was once I was really treading into the true crime area and reading the stories, unvarnished stories, statistics, the victims, reading Michelle McNamara's book, which is absolutely extraordinary. I'll be gone in the dark. Um, so chilling and true. And again, you know, that's why I felt like I needed to do this because this is, this happens every day. Mm -hmm. And I love in Gillian Flynn's introduction to Michelle McNamara's book, she talks about how Michelle is someone who writes about the humanity of victims and writes about crime with humanity. And mm -hmm. that's to me, the, the magic combination, you know, because I love a mystery. I love a darker story and I want to be entertained and I want to, you know, think, could it be that person? Could it have gone down this way? You know, I love exploring all those avenues, but you don't want to feel grody about it. You know what I mean? Like you want to no, make- Or exploitative. Like or exploitative. Or exploitative. Right. So my favorite review actually came from Kirkus, which is like, um, 
you know, it's a trade review. It's, you know, for writers and for the publishing industry. But the reviewer said this beautiful thing about how in the story, the victims aren't convenient. They're not there to move the plot along. Like mm -hmm. they're the they're the story, mm -hmm. right? And so, and what you said it beautifully, it's the how, right? Mm -hmm. How done it? Like, how does this even happen? And, and to me, what I wanted was not just for Anna and Cameron to share a history and to be able to connect. They find each other through the dark, right? Mm -hmm. They lead each other into an incredibly hopeful place, into a place of incredible self-rescue, right? Mm -hmm. But I wanted to Anna to have a shared experience emotional infrastructure, DNA, that thing I was talking about with the predator as well, because to me, events, the events of our lives we're not in control of. Mm -hmm. We can be twisted one way or another. And if there's like a baked in theme or something I'm circling throughout the novel, it's this adage that healed people heal people mm -hmm. and hurt people hurt people, mm -hmm. right? And so you do your work and you figure your stuff out because you want to be one of those healed people, right? Heal people. Yeah. yeah. And that is who Anna becomes. It well is when we meet her. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about like, I'm so jealous just thinking of you spending time in medicine, Mendocino mm -hmm. for yeah. research, yeah. especially right now this year, I've been trying to write my book with COVID. It's like, you can't really take research trips anymore. So let me live vicariously through, <laughs> the, you know, submersive experience that must've been. Yeah. So I spent time there as a young woman, um, hiking, particularly in those, fern forests and redwood forests and the trees there, as you know, if you've mm -hmm. been there at all, seem to have this incredible wisdom, right? They seem to breathe and they seem to have these lives. And so to me, the place needed to be a character, right? It really needed to be a character. So some of it I was drawing on my imagination. And then of course I needed to return to Mendocino a few times for research and for research, like to feed my, to feed my soul. And I had an Airbnb that was this ratty little cabin in the woods that was it's freezing. Um, and it was the light. That's like Anna's. <laughs> That's Anna's cabin. It is Anna's cabin. Yeah. <laughs> when the dawn comes, it has to come all the way through the trees and it's greenish and eerie. And it was, I just knew I'm like, this is where she is. And so every scene when Anna is in the cabin, including the kind of heart pounding finale scene is completely informed in a granular way by what I was experiencing when I was in the cabin, including the smell of mice and the, you know, whatever, the light over the microwave and, and all of it, I used it and, and the paths out onto the bluff. And there's this moment when Anna is in a, a grove of trees that have been twisted by the wind and the salt and all of that. And that that's real. I mean, I've stood in that grove of trees and um, seen the light there and the so quality. Dreamy. Of, yeah, <laughs> it is. It's dreamy. And Tell me you didn't write that heart pounding scene that you're talking about in the cabin while you were in the cabin. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not that much of a masochist. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is a scene toward the end. I don't, I won't spoil anything, but it is quite, you were on the edge of your seat for sure. And I don't think I could imagine writing that while staying alone in that cabin. Like that would even cross the line for me. <laughs> yeah, no, like the scary stuff I have to write in broad daylight. And sometimes right. I have to like hide my resources, my research books, like under things. So I don't see them in a dark room or yeah. <laughs> it is like, you have to kind of temper yourself and protect yourself from mm -hmm. some of those and have really clear boundaries and not take on too much of the darkness yeah. and to yeah. see the light at the end, you know, as, as dark as this story is, its ultimate message is, is super hopeful. And yeah. so I was pointing myself at that all the way through. Speaking of, you know, self, you know, things you can do for self care and take care of yourself. Um, there is a dog character in the book named Cricket. <laughs> and my personal belief is that books with great dog characters should earn an extra star on Goodreads, like just for that alone. <laughs> just automatically. 
but it is, it's like, you know, Cricket appears in Anna's life early um and then they kind of go their separate ways for a little bit and I have this like tug on my heart the whole time like please take cricket in like you two need each other you know and and they do they're you know ugh, they're amazing together and it just it was so good for the soul to see them come together so I don't know if that comes- Glad you loved cricket yeah I know you're a dog person <laughs> I too am a dog person and for Anna, it's almost like what we were saying about Tally, how Tally is this resource for her. Mm -hmm. She's collecting, as we go through the book, she's collecting resources that help ground her and open her up. Cricket, as a, as a character, as a presence in the book, opens her up, like opens her heart, makes her softer, Mm -hmm. makes her aware that she, she actually does need help. And that this dog, in fact, it's like, you know, I guess it's kind of smarmy and a cliche, but the dog rest, the dog rescues her, right? Chooses her and in a way kind of saves her from herself. So, yeah. And I, yeah, I think it's like, it just, to me, I felt so comforted knowing Anna had cricket, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like Anna, Anna needed that. Um, and, you know, cricket's a real dog. Oh, like, oh, it is a real dog who happens to be living in Pasadena at this very moment, living in a very good life. Um, yeah, like Cricket is a real is a real dog that I met, and uh, I looked in her eyes and I told her I would put her in a book, and then I did oh, it. I know she definitely understood you too. Yes, that's a great dog. <laughs> Um, so one of the symbols that you talk about in this town in Mendocino is the time in the maiden. So is that real in the village? Hang on just a second. Okay. Show and tell. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, you have to go to Mendocino. I know. Like, I, I romantic, do romantic weekend. Take your dog. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's the most iconic thing in the village and the village is all like these beautiful Victorian houses and it does look like it's, it's been trapped in time, but there's, uh, it's now a credit union, but it was a Masonic lodge and this sculpture has been in place since 1865 and it, it, it's eerie. So it's father time, who is also death, braiding the hair of this young woman in front of him right? And mm-hmm. he's got the scythe and she's got an urn and there's an hourglass and there's an acacia branch and all of these um, completely baffling symbols. Nobody knows what they mean. It's like a puzzle in plain sight, I say in the book. And if you live in the town, you're always looking up at this weird thing, but yeah, time in the maiden, death in the maiden. It's just, why is he braiding her hair? Like what's going on there? And um, <laughs> I just had to put it I had to put it in the book. Well, passing by it every day. And how could I not? I mean, look, right. at it. it's just right. And it's, of course, in the artwork. I'm also just looking at the sky behind that, which is and like, it looks just like that. Just, just crisp, heartbreaking you know? blue. Like, wow. Blue. Oh, wow. Oh. Blue. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Beautiful. All right. I do want to just check the chat because I see that we are getting some questions. Okay. Um, Oh, this is interesting. Um, So Sherry asks, uh, Paula, do you agree with the storyline emphasis for Hadley and Martha in the new Ken Burns documentary, Hemingway? Well, I think Ken Burns can do no wrong. I mean, I really think he's an extraordinary um, figure and I loved it. I loved the documentary. I particularly loved Hadley and the way Carrie Russell, who does the voice of Hadley, enlivens and um, Hadley became real again for me. In fact, it was so hard for me to watch because I had all the same emotional, the poignancy, the, you know, the loss, but the love too, Mm -hmm. right? Um, I loved it. I loved the whole thing. There were a couple of things. It's so funny. I felt kind of territorial. I might have different points of view. You know, I don't want to argue. How could I argue with Ken Burns and this extraordinary thing that he's done? Um, I feel so territorial about Hemingway. Somebody once said, a reader once said, 
that Hemingway actually had five wives. I'm the fifth, right? Like I- <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> both Norman and, and Hemingway's fifth wife. And I did, I kind of wanted to not correct people so I could be right. But I wanted to like protect him and also protect the women who I know so well because I've steeped myself in their lives. And, but it was, and the, oh, the photographs and the music and the feel of it was really, was really something. I know what you mean about that, that sort of like adrenaline kind of surge that happens when you feel like some piece of content, whether it's like a movie or a book kind of stumbled in close to your your territory mm -hmm. yeah it's like this it's very you know uncomfortable it's primal yeah Yeah. and it's like I want I want to watch it and immerse myself in it but like I also feel so much anxiety about it um that's very interesting yeah yeah um so oh I like this question a lot um I would be interested to hear your take Eleanor asks what do you think the growing popularity of true crime and domestic noir says about our culture? Oh, I think, and I'd love to hear your point of view about this. I think we're just increasing our tolerance for telling the truth, right? And we're increasing our tolerance for understanding the ways uh, looking at the darkness that exists that's all around us, makes us stronger, arms us against the dark. It's counterintuitive. We hide from these things because we wish they weren't true, Mm -hmm. right? The way victims of sexual violence, for instance, and this is so common, tell no one, Mm -hmm. right? Tell no one and carry this story and they're weighted down by it. To tell one person, to tell your daughter, right? To tell your sister. And I think that this is what we're learning empowers us and kind of takes back the night. Remember yeah. that? Remember that in the 1990s? I remember um, take back the night from yeah, like walks I when I was in college. Yeah. I think we're, I think we're, we're ready. I feel yeah. that we're getting ready to. And I do always wonder, like, you know, it was like the conversation about like the unlikable female narrator that was like happening a couple of years ago when like Gone Girl was like such a phenomenon and like um, and you know I don't necessarily think that this is anything new I think that there's always been um so much interest in true crime and you know what they're calling domestic thrillers now I just wonder if it's like women uh, are getting their, their kind of due in terms of their recognition in this world, um, in, in the world of this genre, I mean. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm even hesitant to say that I think it's like a growing popularity. I also just think we have so many platforms for content these days that it just feels like. Yeah. A natural, right. Mm -hmm. Right. But I think that that interest has always been there. I mean, even with some of the research I'm doing now into old crimes and um, how young women were like drawn to like the courtrooms, like when these horrific murder trials were going on, you know, like what drew them there? You know, this is 40, 50 years ago, you know, so women, you know, and men too, men were in, in these courtrooms and just coming in, you know, they wanted to be, um, they wanted to watch, they were curious, you know? So I I think that curiosity has, has always been there, but exactly. I loved what you said about. Yeah. I also think we're looking for guideposts, right? Because Mm -hmm. we're trying to, there's violence all around us, just like there's loss and suffering all around us and within our lives. And what's the path to survival, right? How do you then come through that and mm-hmm. be louder and fiercer and reach back and help others? And we're looking, I think we're looking um, for a way through and, and it's here, right? It's, it's absolutely here. So why not talk about it? Um, so someone with your uh, main character's namesake, Anna, has a question. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, it seems that so much of the book, the stories and characters came to you. Therefore, did you struggle with any part of the story of writing this or was it all fun? I would like to know uh, what parts were a struggle because 
No, my God, it wasn't all fun. I mean, yeah. I love my work. So I'm always having fun on one level because it's just so delicious and freeing and saving to just surrender to a story. But obviously I'd never had to like hide clues before plant clues, unplant them because I did it wrong. Um, right. Red herrings. What the conventions of the genre are um, ingrained and also the learning curve was super steep, right? Draft after draft and mm -hmm. figuring things out as I went. I can I consider it like continuing education, right? <laughs> and I do think of what we were talking about earlier about jumping across that chasm, the risk does create, I think, an opportunity for growth mm -hmm. always when we plunge into new territory, when we learn a new language, I feel like I'm learning a new language in a way, um, then there's, there's just a window opens, a door opens, the ceiling blows off and then more things feel possible. Um, yeah. I am curious. So I felt like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but at the end where there's the conversation about the you know, five girls who have been missing in 1972 and that case was never solved. Okay. Was that a little bit of a setup for a future? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, maybe. So for those who haven't read the book, there are two kind of two timelines. There's the 1990s and then there's the 1970s. And when Anna finds the missing poster, she's reminded of a crime at a uh, an abduction that happened in her past, which is part of her, her story. So that's kind of what um, Jessica is talking about. And when I got there, by the way, Jessica, that's also, um, those, those cases are real. I, so I, the I, 1972 I cases like the 1990 cases are actually, these are real. They were, and they're still unsolved. And so oh. yeah, yes, they're, there was a thought as I put that into scene that there might be a sequel. I was leaving some breadcrumbs for myself as I was writing because obviously, you know how it is when you're writing, you become so invested in the world. Mm -hmm. Cricket, you know, these characters, Tally, like the bartender, Wanda, the homeless couple that live in the park. These feel like real people to me. And I'm incredibly invested now in what happens to them. It feels like they live on after you turn the pages of the book or turn in your manuscript or whatever. So yeah, I, I like to think it's a possibility at least. I, I really hope you do so because I would be very eager to read Detective Anna Hart continuing on and the idea of like kind of solving a real case. Um, is, I mean, not really solving it, but solving it in fiction yeah. is mm -hmm. just a really like kind of alluring setup, I think, or like prospect for a book. Okay. Um, yeah. And I would just love to spend more time with Anna Hart. So yeah. um, I, yeah. I was hoping the answer to that would be like a resounding yes, but it wasn't a no. So we were like, I think we can nudge you in that direction. I am curious if you were when you were writing this, if you did, because sometimes when I'm, I have all different ways of reading, right? Like I have reading for research. I have reading for pleasure. Um, I have reading with like a critical eye when I'm in like a certain phase of drafting a book um, where I'm reading a book to kind of see how this author kind of pulled off whatever it is I'm struggling with. I'm just curious if there were any books in uh, this this world and this genre um, that were, uh, you know, kind of critical to your process in, in yeah. writing stars. Yeah, no, it's sort of, I think of them as my council of elders, mm -hmm. right? Have around me. I made a decision not to read a bunch of crime novels, thrillers, suspense, because I didn't want to be over, overburdened. I didn't want too many voices in my head. But I had read Tana French. I think she's extraordinary, particularly for atmosphere and for the inner life of her characters. Um, I think she has, and the lyricism that she makes it work somehow. I'm a huge fan of Kate Atkinson. Mm. So freaking smart. Mm -hmm. And there's so much texture. 
Yeah. Right? If not, she breaks all the rules in terms of like what it means to turn a page. She stops, she takes as much time as she wants to build like the Jackson Brody character in the mm-hmm. series who's listening to the Dixie chicks and like thinking about his ex-wife. Yeah. Know? And, and that's as much as an imperative part of the story as anything that he's trying to solve. And so, and Louise Penny, um, who's a Canadian writer, has this wonderful series, you know, set in Three Pines, um, Inspector Gamache. And I just really liked thinking of the world, right, as a whole, almost like a snow globe, right, that you can pick up and shake the pieces and that the world has this integrity and is really a place that we feel like we could step out of the pages of the book and into that world and it would hold us. And I, I felt like that's the other thing is like, there are these part of what I do love so much about the genre is like the, the skill in which authors create these worlds, you know, where you are, you are dealing with, you know, darker elements of humanity, but at the same time, you are grounded in these worlds that do, like I said, like make you feel safe, make you feel like this is a real place. And there are people there who care about each other. And I just think having that tenderness in a crime novel is, um, is just so important. Um, and it just adds such another beautiful dimension. Um, and that's, you know, that's why I could like read, I said, what I told you is, you know, I read this book, the first trip my husband took during COVID and I was alone in the house for five days and I was scared at every Creek I heard, but like this book soothed me and calmed my nerves. Um, because I felt one, so engrossed in trying to figure out what the mystery was. And two, I just felt really taken care of by Anna. Oh, what a beautiful thing to say. Thank you. I will take that. I will absolutely. Take that. <laughs> and so is there anything else you're reading right now that you're just absolutely you loving? Anything that I'm reading now, like you, I have to read so much for work, but I'll tell you that reading Favorite Sister was a delight. I read, <laughs> I read and I listen at the same time. Do you ever do that? Or like, I actually I'm don't. I'm not a big listener to books. Oh. Yeah. So I, I take my kid. I have a 14 year old son and I have to drive him to school and it's 45 minutes out and it's 45 minutes back. And so that's the time. And also the dog walks, I can listen, but then I have it at my bedside too. Yes. Yeah, so you can pick it um, back up. That's smart. I just don't ever go anywhere. So <laughs> Um, before before oh. Elaine takes us off stage, can I just ask um, selfishly what you're working on now? Oh, well, I'm working on my third book um, and I'm very, very close to turning in a fairly finished, polished draft, um, which I don't know, hopefully would come out maybe this time next year. But the biggest thing is we're going in, we're in pre-production for the movie adaptation of my first novel, Luckiest Girl Alive. Um, And Mina, Mila Kunis is um, playing Ani, the lead role. And so, yeah, I'm getting ready. It's most of the filming is going to take place in Toronto and I'm getting ready to head up there soon. And you know, make wardrobe choices. And I don't know, I'm going to learn a whole bunch because I've never, this is my first rodeo. I've never had anything, you know, go like this. So very exciting. I'm sure it will be absolutely amazing. (laughs) And she'll breathe life into this character that. Oh yeah. I mean, Mila is like coming in like she she, guns blazing. She can cut a bitch. (laughs) (laughs) Wonderful. Both of your books are so visual that I I have my own movies in my mind for them, but I can't wait, frankly, uh, to, to see The Luckiest Girl Alive. I'm just yeah. very excited about Congratulations. that. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. And I'd, like to get, you I'd really that. like to be the one who gets to choose the wardrobe. I think that must be so much fun. It's just yeah. so important to this. Lots of Pinterest book. boards going around. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thanks to both of you for this just wonderful evening. I just am so grateful. And I'm so glad that you mentioned audiobooks because I too get the hardback 
and have it by my bedside. And then I go to Libro FM, which you can find on the Book Passage website. And that's a, a um, audiobook company that supports independent bookstores. And so when you buy from them, you're buying from the local independent who you signed up from. So I hope some people will do that because it is fun to have both the audio and the book. And those who have to drive a lot, it's really nice. Uh, and I just, I am so happy that uh, Paula did do some signatures on these books. So we have not a ton of them, but a few that are signed uh, first editions. So I highly recommend that you let us know if you want a signed one and we'll send it if we do. If not, we'll send you the others. Uh, all of Paula's books and all of Jessica's books can be ordered from bookpassage.com or in our Corte Madeira or Fairy Building stores. And you, if you want to see this again, uh, it is going to be archived on YouTube or if you have friends who didn't get to see it tonight, you can tell them about this amazing event. It's on the Book Passage YouTube channel. But in the meantime, I just hope everyone will enjoy reading these fabulous two women. What a treat. Thank you both so much. Thank, Thank you. you. You're a wonder. Thank you so much. Thank I just you. really enjoyed every moment of our conversation. Are you sure you haven't been friends for years? <laughs> <laughs> Feels like it. Yeah. So 